Awesome. Well, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm sitting in Toronto, Canada. It's about 9 a.m. Eastern here. Uh, we're so honored uh, to have you uh, and a global audience uh, eager to engage in a real conversation today about the underrepresentation of women and other underrepresented people in tech. Um, my name is Anna Dewar Gully. I'm co founder and co CEO of the equitable innovation company Title Equality and co creator of a method for equity innovation called Equity Sequence, which is a powerful tool for equitable innovation. And it's an honor to lead this discussion. And I want to thank the team at, at Equality Leaders, especially Manakshi, for inviting me to lead the conversation today. Today, we're going to dive into what tr it truly takes to address the underrepresentation of women in tech. I'm joined by an amazing group of panelists who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves in a moment. And together today, um, I invite you to think creatively with us about what it really means to address underrepresentation of women holistically. That's the title. And when I say holistically, what I mean is in terms of the broad diversity of women that exist and who could be shaping our technology futures. I also also mean in terms of technology cultures as a whole, not just their recruitment practices. And I'm thinking about holistic in terms of what it means to really build a technology future that embraces us all and invest in all of our ideas, because all of those ideas are needed for that future that I think all of us on this call want to be part of. I want to challenge all of you as audience members uh, to keep this conversation, also the panelists, to just be candid in this conversation, to keep it real. There is no way that any of us can solve the very material challenges that exist in our world of technology or in our broader business or organizational world if we can't be honest about the problems we're actually facing uh, because innovation comes from a, a real uh, you know reckoning with those actual problems um, and there's no way we can be innovative with our solutions unless we address them head on so I invite the panel uh, as they know from our prep conversation to be as candid and as real as you possibly can to feel free to address those juicy problems problems in ways that make you feel comfortable. Um, and I also encourage the audience to do the same in the chat. I want those folks that are watching us today to consider themselves part of this conversation. I want you to feel free to use the chat as a dynamic place for dialogue. I want you to throw in your ideas, your reactions, your questions at any point during this discussion. And I'll do my very best to try to catch some of those ideas and bring them into my follow-up conversations. Okay, so we're gonna get started now and there will be a Q&A at the end, by the way. I'm gonna start by asking Karen Blake first to introduce herself and then Karen is gonna nominate her next panel member to introduce themselves um, and then we're gonna get started with the questions. Karen, over to you. Thank you and, and hello um, and, and welcome to the session today. Um, I'm Karen Blake. I'm the co-CEO at Tech Talent Charter. Um, we're a not-for-profit organisation that looks to drive diversity and inclusion across the tech ecosystem. We work with over 800 companies um, of all sizes from your startups and scale-ups all the way to kind of global corporations and pretty much everything in between. Uh, we work with policymakers to make sure that we're surfacing those gra grassroots challenges uh, and really driving the conversation, making sure that we're giving tangible, tactical support so that organisations can really make the change um, because we need to act now for next. And Ashley, let's come over to you next. Brilliant. So my name is Ashley Ainsley. I'm the co-founder of an organisation called Colour in Tech. Um, we are a community ultimately of um, people from ethnic minority backgrounds in the technology industry and they also run um, Black Tech Fest, which um, does exactly what it says on the team. It's a great festival celebrating the, the contributions of the black community to the tech industry. And Ashley, do you mind nominating your next panelist for an intro? Oh, cool. Yeah, um, I'll go for Athena. Thanks. Thank you, Ashley. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. I'm Athena. Um, I'm going to start a little bit differently today. Um, I'm a girl born of, of Greek origin, raised here in, in the USA, hailing from a very humble conservative family with nothing more than a huge passion and a humble dream for myself to become the first female exec in my family. Now, the journey hasn't been easy, and we're going to talk quite a bit about that today. But now drawing from over 30 years of experience and collaborating with some of the most exciting brands and executives worldwide, 
across diverse sectors and, and tech is one of them. Um, an expert in customer experiences and focusing on, on growth talent and solutioning, I am very committed to assisting others and creating both a thriving business and a fulfilling life regardless of who they are and where they come from. So I'm here today not only as a tech leader, but also as a woman who has faced many challenges and opportunities in this very space. So I'm excited about today's conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And I would like to hand over to Miranda. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Miranda Gosa Mensing. I'm based in Dublin in Ireland, and I'm the Global Talent Counselor for McKinsey's Digital Practice where I drive uh, talent strategies. And I'm also uh, a fellow of Cambridge Judge Business School, where for many years I have been empowering women, rising women leaders and teaching uh, concepts around strengths-based leadership, resilience and purposeful leadership. And today um, I'm delighted to be here and also share some of our research from the McKinsey Women in the Workplace reports and the reports and research we have done around the gender gap in Europe. Thank you, Miranda. Okay, I'm going to start with the first question. And again, audience, I invite you to use the chat, react to what you're hearing, ask follow on questions, and I will try to bring them into the dialogue. I'm going to start with Ashley, and I'm just going to ask you, Ashley, in your experience as a change maker, a strategic leader, an advocate for advancing underrepresented populations and women in tech, if you could quickly frame for our audience what you see as the most significant challenges addressing that underrepresentation problem, and why do you believe a holistic solution is needed. And then we're going to do the same process. I'm going to ask you, this is just an introductory question for all of the panelists. Same question goes to everyone. So Ashley, feel free to pass the mic when you're done. Thank you. Got it. And I um, I must have picked the short straw on that one. because I mean, there's a whole industry of uh, of work that goes back, I think, decades, of, <laughs> of which I've got to try and um, summarize in, 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 a few, in a few moments. So um, I think the first thing is to actually give that context. You know, the stuff that I'm going to say isn't exhaustive, but isn't exclusive to that. There's a whole body of work which has gone into, you know, where we are today and addressing some of the challenges we are today. Um, as part of Colour and Tech, we actually put together some research looking at some of the barriers that, um, I suppose, in particular, ethnic minorities face in the workplace, um, but also, you know, what some of the challenges um, and things that would actually enable them in subsequent research as well. Um, and one of the overwhelming things that I think we just still need to call out is, is discrimination. I mean, both how that's experienced in the workplace in terms of whether it's, you know, overt harassment, um, intimidation, um, you know, maybe some more like, you know, benign sorts of activity as well. You know, that's not to diminish or, or belittle things. But, um, you know, I think sometimes we need to still say that, um, you know, our workplaces are still um, reflections of where we are as a society. And unfortunately, we do still instances of discrimination, racism, sexism, homophobia. And, you know, that affects, um, you know, women, um, uh, you know, in, in particular and disproportionately often in, in many of the environments that, um, that, that, that women are in. Um, and, you know, I think if there is uh, one way to summarize all of the stuff that goes into it, I think we can probably call it to that. I think, you know, there are some particular challenges which we're seeing across society at the moment. And that can be anything from kind of like a rise of, I suppose, what some people would almost say is socially acceptable misogyny. Um, I don't think it's acceptable, but, you know, you're seeing people, you know, the rise of kind of like some of the thinking for, promoted by people like um, Andrew Tate and kind of what does that mean for, you know, some young men in our society and their view places and in women and how does that percolate to, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, more, more, more senior, um, uh, I suppose, men in these society and in our industries as well. Um, you know, something that we've come across people talking to us a lot about in the last six months is kind of the fatigue around diversity and inclusion in general. And, you know, I use that as a bucket to talk about all of the kind of the work and progress and programs and initiatives that people have put in place to, to address some of these inequities that we see. And I think a level of apathy um, can also lead to a lack of progress. Um, and I think that is, um, you know, that is kind of, you know, life's hard right now. You know, there's cost of living, there's, there's all these things that are going on. It's not easy. And, you know, um, people are often looking for easy things to do. And, you know, this work isn't easy. If it was easy, we, you know, we would have, you know, made made a lot more difference, um, you know, a lot earlier and a lot more quickly. So, yeah, I can, I, I can, I can kind of, you know, put a lot of those things in context. I think one thing that I would want to kind of emphasize though is that there is progress. I think we are, for example, collecting and, and monitoring and holding people to account far more on data than we ever have before. 
um, I think that those structural progress things are actually really important because when there is apathy, I think we can go and point to stuff as well. When people want to push back on stuff, I think we can point to the evidence of, um, you know, the source on things that Samandra will come on to in terms of the research that McKinsey has done as well. So, you know, I think that there is there is progress. I think some of that is actually systemic and, it, we're, you know, we're building a culture of actually accountability in our society, especially when we talk about how that impacts women. I think that is a good thing that, you know, we have embedded across of course, you know, we're now having discussions around things that we wouldn't even be discussing maybe a decade ago. So I think there is progress. I think there are a lot of barriers. And if I was to summarise it, I still think that's because um, elements of discrimination are still far too acceptable and and, and what well, acceptable are far too accepted um, in our in our society. So um, let me pause it there. Obviously, happy to dive in more on you know some of those specific elements, but. I think that's kind of the way that I would set the scene up first. And I mean, if I was going to hand over the mic, I know I mentioned McKinsey, so I'd love to hear maybe Samantha's um, kind of insights or thoughts to that as well. Sure, very Sasha. happy to. I think um, what strikes me still is the discrepancy between research and evidence we have found on why diversity matters, right? And I can talk a little bit through some of these figures. And at the same time, the reality where we're still at, despite many, many efforts and a lot of money spent. So. Um, I saw some research that we're spending billions of dollars these days, right, investing in DEI, and i um, and still the progress has been happening, but slower than expected. And that spend is expected to increase even more. And at the same time, we know that there is plenty of evidence um, for why diversity in the workplace matters. And just to give you a couple of numbers from some of our research that financially even, the organizations that have a more diverse workforce, they tend to outperform the other organizations by 25% plus, right? Some of the highest performing ones, then it gets to almost 40% outperformance just on a financial basis. Then obviously also it contributes to innovation. So again, studies have found that um, if boards have at least 30% of women representation, then that leads to a, up to 4% higher investment in R&D. So that means better innovation and uh, also better environmental scores, for example. And then also when you look at technology, what it means for how products are built, right? Obviously a more diverse um, workplace also means that the products that are going to be built have a more diverse angle and are probably going to cater also to a broader audience. So there's lots and lots of evidence and I think uh, to your point Ashley, organizations are already investing a lot and still the gender gap and especially the gender gap in tech um, is still pretty big. Just to give you a couple of numbers, so at the current rate, if we continue, it was it is going to take us another 151 years to reach gender gap across all levels in economy. Um, in tech specifically, we have looked at Europe and the gender gap is significant there as well. So if we just consider women in tech and tech related organizations, um, we have currently about 37% representation of women. And uh, if you look at women in tech roles, it's even less than that, it's 22%. So still a pretty long way to go. And um, at the same time, as you mentioned, there is a bit of a fatigue because it feels like a lot has been done already and it's moving so slowly. So that is one of the things that is on my mind when it comes to this topic. Thanks, Miranda. I'm going to go to Karen now. Karen, I know you've recently released a report uh, called the Diversity in Tech Report. I know you do this annually, and it's just recently been released in the last week or so. Um, I know you have a particular passion about that underrepresentation that Miranda mentioned regarding the underrepresentation of women in tech roles, as in in the technical creation roles in tech organizations. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that in a bit more detail, uh, and also feel free to share some of the insights that that were more broadly introduced in your report. Report. Yes, absolutely. Um, so each year we, we do ask all of our signatories to uh, contribute to a survey. So we were actually able to produce something that is very detailed looking at tech occupations. And this year we wanted to sort of focus on to understand um, the percentage of gender minorities that are in software engineering roles. Um, and one of the things that we were able to see from that, that actually there's only 20% of software engineers are gender minorities. And um, why is that important? Well, they hold such a, a sort of a, a, a massive influence um, on the culture of an organisation and also 
on the, the creation of tech. When we think about um, a, a startup, often one of the first tech hires is a software engineer. Um, and so the culture is very quickly built based on that. And so if we're having such a small pool that we're bringing in, we know that culture is being built without um, our, our kind of female representation. Forgive me, the light's gone out. Um, but in a more broad sense, when we, we look at uh, tech advancements um, that are happening right now and at the pace of which they're, uh, they're, they're happening, we are at risk of codifying inequality by not having a, a good representation in our software engineering base. When we think about development of AI tools and um, other tools that are so key to running society, we are not having good representation in the build, in, in the build process of those tools. Um, we also have seen some you know, feedback from uh, our, our female technologists that feel that often when they're in other roles in tech and they're bringing their technical expertise to the table in discussions, that sometimes they are undervalued because um, they're seen as that's a less skilled role. So design roles um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so it really, when we're thinking about why is that so important, it's because that's essentially the, the hub of how the tech culture is built in an organization. So that was something really interesting for us to be able to, to surface. In the data, we have seen that there is a general progress in um, women getting into tech, which is good. And celebration that we, you know, we should always celebrate uh, uh, progress, but what we've seen is there's a slipping back. So although women are getting in, they're not getting on. Compared to last year, there are fewer women in senior tech roles, and that's really, really important. So this is in all tech roles, not just software engineers. We, are, we have fewer female technology leaders than we did last year and for us that is something that we we really must take some deep thought to understand the, the reasons why um, that's happened. That's a really interesting one and I'm going to throw that over to Athena Karen because I know Athena in our pre-conversation pre you mentioned some of the over focus uh, on metrics in tech and on certain kinds of metrics and an under focus on the broader cultural and systemic realities in tech companies and so I wonder just building on Karen's insight if you would mind just speaking a little bit to that and sharing your thoughts on why women are getting in but not getting on so to speak to use Karen's language. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, Karen, love the report right away. Um, you know, metrics are undoubtedly um, essential for gauging progress, right? But but culture culture is often not even existent. It's it's not there. And I really wonder at times if the obsession um, that companies have, and especially in the tech space, but not only with numbers is steering us in, in the right direction or if it's just actually missing the point. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I was born in a country where women were not expected to lead. And, and I love Greece and was fortunate to be born into a very supportive family, raised in a country that gave me a different perspective of what my world could be like. But back in the day, in a small country in the Mediterranean, it was the men that found themselves holding, you know, the positions of authority in both public and, and private spheres. But things today have improved, but um, the women's movement has stalled in many countries and there's work to be done. I feel that leaning in alone isn't the complete solution. We need the KPIs, yes, but we also need the executive support, but also the right corporate culture in place. Um, you know, the structural changes in our workplaces need to be created that will create the foundation to make it more flexible and supportive of the minority groups. However, we also need us women uh, to push forward, to lean in and to aim for the leadership roles, to elevate our voice and to amplify it more and more women. And I, I, I loved your points, Karen. I mean, there, and you know, Miranda and, and um, also Ashley mentioned it earlier as well. We, we need to have a stronger voice and to have more and more women applying for those leadership roles. 
it's important that we understand that it's not up to any one individual to change things, but together, each and every one of us, we can. The fight is something that men and women all need to work towards every day. And there's no KPI that will guarantee dreams will come true, but a new level of awareness, the cultural awareness that needs to be driven by our actions and decision making and um, the conscious challenges that we face and how we can overcome them. This all needs to be embraced into a corporate culture. I mean, I can personally say that I quickly learned that even the simple dreams may be the hardest to achieve and becoming a female executive today may not be considered a dream for many, right? But, but just a step in the corporate process, but the journey for a woman fighting for her space, for her voice, 20 or 30 years ago, let me tell you, it wasn't necessarily easy. And it's, um, you know, it has, it hasn't consistently filled me with confidence, but I persevered and I'm here and I'm honored and I'm humbled. But I do believe that in our quest for general gender equality, um, we have often relied on the metrics as our guiding stars. And that's just, that needs to stop. Um, metrics, like the percentage of women in the workplace and the gender gap and representation and all of, all of that, they've become the standard benchmarks. Uh, we need to walk the talk. They've provided us with the valuable insights, absolutely, um, because they've identified the disparities that do exist, but we need to understand that there are limitations to that. And, and, and that's where the numerical snapshot, so to speak, um, you know, it often uh, falls short of capturing the, the challenges that we face day to day in the tech sector and not only. So we've witnessed, with, we've witnessed instances where, you know, companies boost that, you know, positive metrics and without, but without showing that the underlying culture is not really there, right? That hinders women's progress. I think we've all experienced and myself for sure um, multiple discrimination um, ranging from compensation, uh, recognition, benefits, career opportunities. The differences are still heavy set and they do exist. That's really a great point, um, Athena. And I just want to thank you for calling out kind of the, the yuckiness that exists in organizations. I mean, it's often the case, especially on International Women's Day and events like that, where we just kind of talk about the rise of folks that have struggled and we don't spend time in exploring the grit of folks that have struggled. And I think some of the things that you alluded to in your story, you know, speak to the grit that's necessary to kind of combat the realities of most organizational systems which are not designed with equity in mind, right? And so I'm sure there are many people listening and that can hear that in the subtext of your conversation and appreciate that because I honestly think that idea of like the rose colored report or the report that like overly frames what an organization is doing well about DEI and shies away from the challenges, the gnarly problems that are still lurking in that system. I actually think that's one of the biggest problems holding back the pace of change, you know, because it allows us as leaders and as organizations and as community members to have the illusion that these big actions are being taken, these big axes are being swung at the problem, when in reality, we're avoiding the problem. So I just want to really give you a shout out for kind of speaking to it in that way. I think that's really, really important. And um, you know what, we can actually put data to that too. So we yeah. know that it, we, we sort of surveyed um, female technologists and actually one in four women who left a tech job left for a non-tech job. Mm. They were preventable losses. They have left the industry, but not left the workforce. So they absolutely want to be in work, but they're not mm. seeing a place for themselves in the tech industry. So we absolutely know the scale of, of this challenge too, and our, and, and you know the, how we can actually keep those female technologists in our organisations. So I think that that's that's so important to understand that this is this is widespread. 
And I think that's such an important point, Karen, just thinking about the why behind the numbers. You see that decline, but how often do you hear conversations in our communities about why those declines, or how often do you see assumptions that are erroneous about why those declines, right? So as you just said, and you spoke to about your data, and I think this is like some of the limitations of the metrics that many organizations in tech tend to follow, is they tend to be pretty myopic measures, right? They tend to be very singular measures. You see that there's a decline in women tech talent, but we're not asking, why are these women leading? Where are they going? What was the nature of the problem that drove them out? And how could we fix that problem, right? So if we got that level of nuance in our data, these organizations could be fixing those problems. We can't shy away from that problem, right? Absolutely. And women told us yeah. the reasons that they're leaving. They told mm -hmm. us that was because of pay equity. They're not being paid fairly, that they uh, didn't have a, a good career development and they couldn't see how their career was, career was going to uh, progress in that organisation and that their, their work was not flexible enough to mean that they could meet a minimum uh, kind of uh, expectation of a balance that's not and that's please don't read that that is immediately childcare. That's not what we're just talking about here. So we, we absolutely know the reasons why too. So it's now how you use that information to look at your pipeline, look at your your data and go, where are we losing women? And what, you know, essentially what one of those is, is the reason that, that that's happening. Yeah. And Amanda in the chat asks, uh, what can we do to retain women? And I just want to call out those ones that you just mentioned based on those responses. So can we create more flexible workplaces and flexible working cultures? Can we pay women equally? Can we balance lives better, you know, especially for folks that are balancing too much? And can we give women voice? Can we actually get their ideas in the technology room heard, understood, in the strategy room, in the innovation room, heard, understood, and acted on? Um, so those, you know, if you want to know how to retain women, I think it's it's about acting on those opportunities. They're very viable opportunities. Thank you. Okay, going to Ashley, um, you mentioned when we had a, just a pre-conversation and you mentioned initially in your remarks a little bit about this anti-DEI pushback that you're feeling and experiencing, and I'm sure many of us that work in this world are feeling a version of that problem. I want to ask in this particular moment in time, I would imagine many people in our audience are feeling a version of that problem. How are you navigating that skepticism, that pushback, that fatigue that you described, um, particularly when you're faced with arguments that pro progress is insufficient, unnecessary, that the spend isn't driving any results? So how do you tackle that in your work? And if you might help us find some light in this conversation too, can you think of any things that have happened recently in your world that have given you an indication that there's an opportunity there to open that conversation back up in a new way and to address that resistance in a constructive and forward moving manner. So let's just start with what are you experiencing about that pushback? Yeah, so part of me, honestly, I think part of it's more like narrative and, you know, it's, not, it's that whole thing that those who shout aloud just get heard, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's actually happening behind closed doors. I've not encountered really any environments where people from an organizational cults or decision point of view are saying, yeah, we want to return to a world where our companies are like less inclusive or less diverse or like, you know, this isn't something that's not important for us. I think actually we've like solved that battle for most, most sensible thinking, forward thinking companies. I think it's great that some of their data is there and, you know, people all the way up to CEOs are bought into the idea that, yeah, having inclusive, diverse workforces are actually good for their businesses. Um, they, you know, they're better for their products, they're better for their customers, um, you know, it means they're attracting the best people into their organizations. And actually, I think, you know, kind of behind closed doors, a lot of those conversations, I think people will still be having and people do know. I think, you you know, you can go into X or Twitter and kind of, you know, see loads of people shouting and telling you otherwise. But are those really the people making the decisions or who actually really, you know, matter to some extent? Um, at least when it comes to organizational kind of progress. So I think, you know, that's some green light. I was reading a BBC Work Life article um, yesterday that's talked about the DEI stuff and actually, you know, they'll come out with some helpful stats saying that it's still very much on kind of like CEO's agendas. Of course, you know, when there are budget cuts and stuff like that, things do get cut, like, you know, DEI is one of those things. Um, yeah, I think in a sense, it's probably some of it's maybe disproportional. And I think, you know, there's still elements of that battle to, to, to win, but, you know, I think, the most resilient, best innovative businesses will be the ones that survive downturns. And, you know, when they when they come to invest, you know, the, the, the information is quite clear that 
you know, making sure that DI is a as a part of that journey as they as they as they move to growth is is still important to them. And actually, you know, we're still seeing companies who are um, potentially less affected by some of the economic headwinds that we're seeing now are still investing in that space, are still doing stuff in that space, are still want to be doing stuff in that space. Um, and even if they can't be as active, haven't lost the the ambition to do things in that space. So I, I you know, I, I I think it's kind of you know you can kind of see a really dark cloud, but you know when you're like on the airplane, kind of flying above it, you know, it's, the sun's still shining up there. Do you know what I mean? And I think actually I don't want people to get too disheartened because they they hear lots of um, you know some of the more famous entrepreneurs out there, shall we say, on some of these social media platforms coming out and saying saying things which um, you know are largely actually misguided. To be fair, I think again lots of people on this call would probably love to engage in a conversation because we've actually probably got a lot of a lot of things which um, potentially these parties are not privy to and information which probably would help inform more sensible discussion, shall I say? So you know I think there's that. Um, so, you know, that's not to say that, you know, there isn't a pushback or stuff. I think there is a branding issue around some of this inclusion work, um, you know, in the same way that, you know, like 10 years ago, if you're like woke, it was like, oh, that's cool. And now it's kind of some sort of try to be a term of like political ridicule. But actually, if you go back to, you know, the dictionary, it's, you know, who wouldn't want to describe themselves as forward thinking and, and you know, progressive on social issues. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's the way that we've kind of weaponized certain things. And I think that's kind of where DEI is at now. Like, you know, maybe there needs to be a new app and then maybe we're going to have to come up with a new marketing and branding thing for the industry and the work that we do. And, you know, it can sound a bit flippant, but I think, you know, sometimes stuff just gets, gets associated. Do you know what I mean? And I think we, we shouldn't be so so naive to say to you know, the average man on the street, frankly, who might be might be more sympathetic to these things that we need to, you know, probably make the case in a new innovative way to some of these people. Um, but, you know, I think that's a challenge and opportunity. I think what we have now, which we didn't have maybe five or 10 years ago, is a real body of work to actually say, um, you know, here is some of the evidence for why this thing is good. You know, the companies that have been doing this for a sustained period of time have been successful and have largely outperformed those who haven't. Um, if you talk to talent in a way which we haven't been previously doing before and what people want from work, actually, you know, th there is lots of information and data out there where we can make a positive case. And actually, I think the industry probably needs to do more of actually shouting about the wins that we've had, um, you know, not necessarily being kind of almost victims of kind of the narratives that other people want to put on us, but actually saying, yeah, like I'm proud to like run an organisation which is inclusive. But like, there's nothing wrong with me actually wanting to have you know the views of other people in my organization and certainly from kind of a agenda perspective like our business is not any worse for having women on our board or in our leadership team or anything like that um and mm. you know that's the logical end so i suppose where some of this criticism is going what do they want to go back to um, <laughs> like you know where, where were the good times the good, were those really the good times is that what we're actually saying uh, and i think mm -hmm. something we need to challenge that like if, if you want to go back back to what um <laughs> um so, you know, totally. So there's like an out sorry. There. Yeah, oh I was going to say there's yeah. I was just going to say what I'm hearing in what you're saying is that there needs to be an element of reinvention. Like maybe this is one of those, you know, paradigm shift moments for DEI where we need to reimagine what it could be, what it should be and who's engaged and how, what it's what it's even called. I hear you saying we need to be listening to the voices and needs of the many, not just the few. I hear that kind of the famous tech entrepreneur says DEI is over. Is that real or is that just the myopic view of a famous tech entrepreneur and not really the view of the many different diverse humans that live in our world and our organizations and our communities? And I think that like that idea of challenging uh, the rhetoric that it's not yielded results, right? Um, so like to your point about, you know, is a business worse off because it's had women in leadership and to Miranda's earlier points about the statistics saying that absolutely not, like resoundingly not and no. And I would imagine the same for all underrepresented voices in an organization because yeah. income, right? Income, those new and different and innovative ideas. I mean, it's, it sounds like it's also just more overt challenging of is that true? Right. Uh, so that's what I'm hearing and taking away from from what you're saying. Thank you, Ashley. I'm going to go over to Miranda. I'm going to go back to a question that came up in the chat a little while ago about, you know, women not moving up and in and through in organizations. I feel like Miranda might have some insights for McKinsey to share about that specific kind of problem. And they may be actionable for you all uh, in the audience. Go for it, Miranda. 
Yes, indeed. Um, as I mentioned before, we publish the Women in the Workforce report on an annual basis, and we have been observing a trend. I guess there was this notion at some point that there is a glass ceiling for women to progress, and actually we found that's not the case. It's more like a broken run. Um, and what that means is we found that the biggest barrier, the hardest hurdle for women to advance is actually into the first management level. And that's where we see the biggest drop off happening. And then obviously it isn't very easy progressing further, but that's really when the biggest gap is. And when you already come in from a fairly low base of women entering the workplace and then you have the broken rung, so you can see how there is just a much smaller population that gets to the managerial level and has the opportunity to advance forward. And then we looked at um, what are some of the underlying reasons. And we have years of data that show that women experience microaggressions on a significantly higher rate than men in the workplace still. And these can be just being mistaken for somebody more junior, um, not listened to appropriately, um, and different other biases. And um, to your point, Athena, earlier, I guess it's sometimes ingrained in the culture and it's not conscious and surely organizations don't mean to do that. And this is why I believe um, to really make a change, it's important to take a fact-based approach, especially when there are opinions out there about have we solved the problem? Should we still keep going? So the best thing is to come back to numbers, right? And the numbers paint a pretty clear picture that we're not yet there. Moreover, it's a long journey. This is not a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. And this is a completely different approach and how we need to appro approach the situation, right? Um, I guess if organizations think this is a one or two year project and then we're done, this is probably not going to be the case, right? And then the question becomes, how can organizations really unlock um, resources to continue that journey, right? To prepare for that marathon because it's going to continue onwards and onwards, right? And even if their progress is made, um, more progress needs to be made in the future. Thanks, Miranda. Okay, I'm just going to open this up to the broader panel now. And I want to, I want to, you know, just thinking about all the challenges and opportunities that have kind of come up inherent to some of the answers of the panelists um, in light of some of the challenges that we're facing industry wide in terms of organizational focus and attention on DEI, political swings, economic swings, all of those realities that we're contending with out there. I'm going to ask. Karen to start, but I'm going to ask all panelists the same question. What do you think holds the most promise for driving the transformational change we need in terms of the underrepresentation of all women in tech? Um, what needs to happen? What, what are the things that from a database, but also maybe from your experience as a leader in this space, you think organizations and individual leaders trying to drive change need to be focused on right now? So I think for, for me, it, it needs to be strategic. It can't sit on the shoulders of just one individual. You know, this can't be something that we allow to be a side of desk endeavor. There is no other part of your business that you would accept that is a side of desk <laughs> type of activity. You know, yeah. the idea of we'll just let financials, we'll just, someone will pick that up. I'm sure that someone in one of the departments is probably doing great work here. It's, it's madness. People are our businesses. They are our engine house. They are our consumers. So if we don't look after them and we don't recognize that we need to, whatever we call d and it is people's well-being. It is the, the employees that you, you, you have. It's your business. And if you decide that it's really how well you decide to look after them, how well you decide to um, make sure that they feel included, that they can bring all of their um, decision making, their innovation to the table. So it's just how well you're in creating that environment in, in your organisation. So I think that if we don't have that more strategic, systemic attitude to this and allow it to just be, well, that's something that happens in the, you know, our employee resource groups or our affinity networks or someone does that and they're, it's really good of them because, uh, the, you know, every Friday afternoon they spend some time, um, you know, sending out a, a newsletter. That's just not good enough because that's not going to yield all of the great um 
innovation that we know that comes from having diverse teams. And when I think one of the biggest challenges is we're often told the business benefit, but organizations say, well, we've been doing some things and we're not seeing those business benefits because you're not doing it properly. You know, mm. you're you're doing it in such a, a, a kind of half attempt. There's no way that you're going to see those benefits. And so then they say, well, it's failed because we've, you know, we, we did a little bit in our recruitment practice and, and we're not seeing that benefit. So I think really for me is absolutely making sure that you are even if your maturity on this is is right at the beginning really think about how you're connecting each part in your organization not putting it on the shoulders of one individual certainly not putting it on the shoulders of one individual that you do not pay uh, for to do this work and and make sure that you're really recognizing what what's happening in your organization data and stats brilliant but what does someone in your organization say to their friends at the end of their week you know what do they go home and report to their family about your organization and ultimately that's the face that your customers are going to be seeing that's the, the face that your your organization is going to be building their products from so for me it's making sure that you've got that connection all the way through your organization and actually that if you speak to people in your organization that is uh, you know, closely connected to the data that you're you're representing, pulse survey data saying, you know, 95% of our people are, feel our, our workplace is inclusive. Is that true? Mm. Is that how it really feels in your organisation? So I would be, you know, bring your critical thinking to this. Make sure that this is something that whatever you call it, that you're, you're really considering people in your organisation. So I think that that's, you know, I just don't just take this as if we do one bit and just chunk it up and take this piecemeal approach that you're going to get those outcomes because you, it's just not going to happen like that. Mm, thank you, Karen. Yeah, I mean, what I'm really hearing and what you're saying, I mean, this idea, I think, really needs to be called out of like, you can't do transformation off the side of your desk. You know, if you think about any other organizational portfolio resp responsible for driving organization wide transformation, you will find not a single other example where a single leader or a couple leaders are trying to drive that org wide transformation. And yet, year in and year out, that's how we design DEI into organizations. And then we're surprised that the endeavors are only tackled or only touching the edges or the periphery. Uh, so I think that's such an important thing to call out. I also just want to underscore what you said about it's not just about recruitment, it's about the whole business. And I actually think I'm a person who works across industries. I work all over the place, all over the world and across different kinds of businesses. I would say of all the industries that I work in, tech is the place where we are most over-focused on recruitment and forget the most about what it is to be in the rest of the organization as you know, what are the processes, policies, practices, systems in place to move people up and into leadership because they have been given opportunity. And um, so I think that's such a powerful thing is move move that focus well beyond recruitment into every element of the business. And that is going to bring me to kind of asking a version of this question to Athena. I know uh, Athena has a particular passion for the customer experience. And I'm going to ask you to think about this, what opportunities are there question, but from the lens of what opportunities are there to make businesses sit up and pay attention in the tech sphere uh, because DEI needs to be something that serves the customer. Uh, because I think, you know, this recent economic setback that many countries have faced around the world has seen DEI slashed in many places around the world from a budgetary perspective. And the argument is economic. It's like we just don't have the money for it. But I think if it were touching the customer in a much more real way, the end user, the patient, the citizen, the whomever the customer is, uh, you know, the chances that it would be sliced in the next economic crisis might not be as obvious. And so I would love you just to speak to that and consider what's the role of us expanding our thinking around diversity, equity, and inclusion into that customer sphere and technology in a lot more of a deliberate way. Thank you. Um, I love the question, by the way. I mean, look, numbers exist and KPIs are there to, to help drive us, right? And they are indicators and many organizations live by them they see them they believe them but when it comes down to actually taking action we see less and less of that happening and and to your point today's um, economic situation around the world you know the first thing that often gets cut is uh, any activity around de and i right but it actually needs to be part of each organization's dna some 
organizations are stronger than others, but a cultural shift is is what's needed, right? I mean, it needs to be part of the core values that are actually very well respected, implemented. And I totally, I love what Karen said. It's It's absolutely important that this becomes part of the day to day. It's not just about what the numbers show. And you can't wait a year to, to make a difference. A year is way too long. This needs to be a continuous process whereby DE&I is part of the day-to-day. -day. It's conversed in every single interaction with every single consumer, whether it be B2B, B2C. Every single person needs to understand. In some countries, it's, very, it's much stronger than others that um, the brand that is represented in each and every way has a very same voice. We keep the values alive. We're in a situation uh, where the economy or there is uh, another situation happening in the country. That doesn't mean that the first thing that we cut would be the women or any other minority group for that matter, right? It needs to be part of what we do and what we say. Walk the talk and it's not just about the glass ceilings either. It's about the boxes. Remove the boxes. Remove the boundaries. We need to be borderless and boundaryless in everything that we do. If the talent is there, then use it. If you hear a voice, just like when we're, you know, we were talking to people around the world and we talk about customer experiences, absolutely the voice of the customer counts, but the voice of the employee also counts, no matter what. So it's time to put uh, emotion into action and to create a corporate environment that has DE&I and culture as part of its DNA. It's the only way forward. And it's the only way that it will not be cut at the end of the day uh, as a discount to any kind of margin of one or another. So thank you so much. Ashley, do you want to speak to <laughs> No, no. Ashley, do you want to speak to that a little bit too? Um, yeah, ish. Um, like, I think, um, yeah, like, like, yeah, like, um, I kind of lost my chain of thought just now. <laughs> like, it's kind of just gone off on a few different things. Um, mm -hmm. so let me, let me, let me pause and then I'll you come back to you. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Sorry, I got thrown out of the, uh, the, the platform for a second. So I'm just regrouping a little bit myself. So Karen or Miranda, do you want to speak to that? Actually, you know what? I'll ask Miranda if you don't mind. I'm going to ask you to think about, you know, McKinsey's a strategy firm. Karen called for strategy. Um, what's, what, what's the strategic approach to DEI that's missing in today's world in tech? I think many organizations are already doing a lot of great things, so I wouldn't say it's completely missing, but um, what we found is what we call the four R's, right? And if organizations and society would follow some of that, that could really over time uh, show an impact, right, in closing the gender gap uh, in tech in particular. And let me talk about those four R's, and some of them are related to organizations and others are related to uh, even bringing women into the funnel, which is the first one, the ramp up. So we have to start working on bringing more women even into STEM uh, subjects and um, sort of boost the top of the funnel, right, of women coming into these roles. And there, in my experience and from our research, there's a couple of reasons why this is not consistently happening. And it has to do with a lack of role models, right? Because obviously there's fewer women um, that have successfully progressed and are successful in these roles, um, which then creates also a lack of mentorship from like-minded women. And some of the things I'm hearing personally from some women is to say, I, I just often felt like I didn't belong. I was one of the only ones, right, in the classroom later on um, at work and so on. And I guess over time, it really sort of eats away at women's sense of belonging. And to the point earlier, then uh, leads to some women actually leaving the tech industry or tech roles, even if they bring the relevant backgrounds. So the first one is the ramp up. Um, the second one is retaining women, right, in organizations, uh, really encouraging uh, programs and actions that actually help increase the number of women that come into tech careers and stay in tech careers. 
And again, there's lots of things to be done there in terms of sponsorship, opportunity creation, and so on, um, to kind of fix that broken rung that I mentioned before and make women feel excited to stay on and really progress throughout the ranks in their career. Then the third one is around reframing, right? I mentioned earlier that we're finding that um, there's still a lot of bias happening. And um, we found that 70% of women experience microaggression still at work, which is a pretty high number. So how can organizations systematically address those biases and really help hold their leadership teams accountable and put programs in place to counter these biases? And then the fourth one and last one is the redeployment. So I think it's also important to continue investing in women's uh, skills and also think about non-traditional ways and pools of hiring women. Um, so that is another fourth area. And I think, as we have seen, this is not an easy solution, fortunately. And as I said before, it's not a sprint, but it's something that in combination, these four things, if organizations were, put to, were to put real KPIs in place, focus on activity, bring leadership attention to these areas, right? Then over time, we would really uh, hopefully see the gender cap gap closing more and more. Can I add an R to your four R's to make it a five? Kind of the responsibility. So that's the accountability of everyone in the organization to play their part. And that's really important. The other sort of R is that lots of the time, underrepresented groups feel that they are responsible for their type so if they make a mistake, suddenly that's the value judgment of a woman, you know, and I think that that is so, so difficult when you feel you can't take the same risks because you are accountable in a different way to your colleagues. And that can sometimes make it really difficult to progress. And I've heard some dreadful practice here where essentially women have been told we've already got one of you. And we've kind of that's enough. Like we've we, we've we've got enough, and and yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and and I think that this is we, we've got to have that balance. That absolutely we take people's achievements and their their the, the risks they take individually to that person, um, rather than make you know thinking about that broadly across a group so I think that I would bring that uh, that extra R into it that accountability for everyone in the organization to play their part and then that we we count people's achievements as an individual and also um, you know sometimes when things haven't gone so so well um, individually as well Thank you, Karen. Okay, I'm going to open this up now. I just want to thank the panelists for their incredibly insightful ideas, challenges, all of that. I think I feel like it's been, from my perspective, a great conversation. I hope the audience has enjoyed it as well. I want to invite now the audience to drop in questions by panelists. Ashley, did you want to come back to you? Sorry, forgive me. Yeah, Go for it. Another, another R, which is retention as well. <laughs> um, I think obviously there's a lot of focus and energy on kind of like, you know, pipeline and recruiting and hiring, et cetera, et cetera. But looking at the people who, who leave, the reasons why they leave, what that tells you, and also focusing on that to actually drive the change, right? You know, sometimes I've worked with organizations and it's, it's great that they focus on the upline, but I, I have far more conversations about like, you know, the, the top of the funnel than I do about kind of like the pipeline at the back end of the funnel, what people are doing For and why sure. they're leaving. Um, yep. So yeah, I think that's just another one, but yeah. Open 100%, up to, so um, responsibility, role models, retaining women, retention, uh, retraining it or redeployment um, and reframing. Uh, so very useful ideas. And I feel like they're very aligned with the findings that Karen's put forward and also some of the, the insights from the work that Ashley and Athena have brought forward. Um, and maybe there's also re the reinvention. You know, we could throw in a sixth star there just to go crazy. Okay, so questions from the audience. Um, I'm just going to read them quickly. So forgive the silence, the awkward silence, just for a second. So I'm going to read this out from Alyssa. I think there's a perception issue about what it's like to work in tech and a lack of understanding on the variety of tech roles. We have a corporate graduate scheme, which involves a three month placement working in a tech role, and this could completely turn around that perception. So, I mean, there's a very practical strategy and idea, um, you know, thinking about, you know, can we give more people more exposure to what those options are in tech? Uh, can we create programs that provide that exposure, that 
opportunity to that learning. That's a very actionable uh, tactic, and I think something that's very worthy of, of contemplating. Any other questions from the audience? We I'm have just about seven minutes left. Go for it. Yeah, go for it, Karen. I just want to throw another side of that as well. So it's absolutely about giving that exposure to underrepresented groups so that they can see those opportunities. But it's also about making sure that we're helping to inform those teams um, as well. Otherwise, it, it becomes a little bit like a, a, a tour where, you know, and it actually plays into undervalue um, the, the, the kind of underrepresented groups in these scenarios. So it's really important that when we're doing that work, we're also looking at those teams and, and making sure that we're doing that kind of internal comms uh, sort of process of making sure they understand why why this is valuable how they're expected to act and what you know what their role to play in this as well so that we get a really successful combination of things and that's how then we we actually uh, rather than this just being a, a, an exposure point it's actually landing to be something that that builds to to be successful yeah so i mean there's a lot more work in that isn't there to to go and figure out why is representation needed on this specific technical team? How could that work? How could we create that environment? There's a lot of work in that, that the single person doing this work off of the side of their desk, unfortunately, probably doesn't have the capacity to do that work in their day to day and their time, right? So that really does speak to that bigger picture. How do we get everyone engaged and thinking about how to solve these problems versus how do we think that it's just a singular person who has to drag the whole organization with them uh, towards those solutions. Okay. Um, on the last comment by the last speaker, this is from the chat, it's quite common to see non-diverse senior leadership set women against women, women against women of color, women against trans people. We need to highlight these tactics and find a solution. Does the panel have any suggestions for tackling this reality of pitting women against women across identities? Anybody who feels to take that? Hey, I mean that's that's a big question, isn't it? And and there's a lot to to talk about in terms of how we're creating the right environments for people not to be in a scarcity mindset, and making sure that they don't feel that the only way to succeed is that really competitive um, approach. That they feel that unless they're able to position themselves in a way that is successful and distinct, that they're going to to miss out on opportunities. So I mean, bullying, harassment. Um, discrimination isn't right in any form no matter who is uh, who's doing it so being a woman does not stop you from uh, bad practice so I think that that's absolutely and when that's happening that needs to be dealt with appropriately through your HR procedures like and let's not shy away from that but I think that when you're working in a scarcity mindset where everyone is um, you know feeling very responsible for their type that is very difficult and that creates this sort of environment where people do feel that they have to be uh, distinct and competitive um, and that's not always that, that well that's that's really valuable to have that kind of competitiveness mm, thank you yeah. i'm just gonna one leave it one last one to, for it yeah, one, thing like, one of the biggest logical flaws that people come out with in such lazy arguments is this false dichotomy you know that it's one or the other or that we have you know mm. by focus on one thing we can't do something else or that you know there's some sort of resource scarcity which means i can only think about one thing at one time like we we have to challenge people to be better as well. We have to hold people account and call out that fallacy mm. as well. Like we need to actually say like, you know, it's not a, well, we can only do this for women or we can only do this for black people or we can only do this for the disabled. Like we need to, we need to hold ourselves to a better standard. We need to push back on that and actually say, well, how do we do these things? Or this is important. Or we're not prioritizing one group over the other. And we need to, we need to challenge ourselves to be better thinkers at that because there are ways to do things um even with finite resources and we just have to be more we have to challenge ourselves to think better right it's very lazy thinking just to be like well i'm just going to present a fourth dichotomy and say it's one or something else thanks ashley okay i'm going to address this last question i'm going to ask one of the panelists who feels that they can speak to this question to address it and then i'm going to do my very best to summarize this very rich conversation okay so how this is a person asking i think about their own career how to move up from first line of management to the c-suite considering you possess the necessary skills but finding blockers and so i want you to consider the insights you have the data you have access to any really tangible strategies that this person asima can apply in her own career or whoever's career she's curious about. <laughs> 
Maybe I'll make a start. In my experience, mentorship and sponsorship matters a lot, finding the right network of people who are supporting us because no career is made just by skills and uh, it always takes sort of a village to help us grow. So I would recommend building that network in very purposeful ways and also building in some challenging voices, right, in a positive way that are different than we are because that's often where we can learn the most. Thank you so much, Miranda. Okay, so I just want to really thank the panelists for their insightful ideas, for their data, for their very practical frameworks that I think can be applied across different shapes and sizes of organizations. I'm going to just share a few of the takeaways that I got from listening to those insights. I heard that we really need to be thinking about how do we bring equity, diversity, and inclusion throughout the whole body of an organization and in tech specifically, not just think about it as a recruitment improvement drive, but actually as a whole organization or whole system improvement exercise. We need to challenge reductive and wrong narratives to Ashley's point about that lazy thinking, but I feel like that theme actually came up in many of the parts of the conversation. We probably need to reinvent what this thing DEI is called in the context of our current uh, world society and maybe it's just that time for a paradigm shift i actually have felt like that very deeply in my work um and and maybe that means reinventing our solutions and making sure those solutions are not just tactical solutions that are applicable at the front end of an organization but they're solutions that resonate throughout a whole that to karen's earlier point bring in the team where the diversity is needed um and we need to start thinking really seriously not about defunding dei but about investing in it more broadly and thinking about it as a transformation team and making sure it has the skills, resources, investment, time, capacity, and leadership buy-in to actually make that transformative change so that we can start to make, you know, the business case come to life and not just be a slide deck you hear at the beginning of a conversation about can we have funding for this singular DEI initiative. This needs to be something that is to yield its real value built into the fabric of an organization. I want to thank everybody for spending this hour with us this morning. I want to wish everybody a happy International Women's Day tomorrow and an International Women's Day this month. Uh, thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions and participation and for your active listening uh, and to the panelists, uh, thank you for you know really uh, being candid, honest, frank in your dialogue. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you all.